Okay, so we are starting. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Planning, Publishing, and Profiting Workshop. I'm so glad you were able to join me today. And I am going to start with our video. I'm going to go right on into the um, PowerPoint. So you may see me, a small picture of me, but not what you're seeing right now, because I'm about to switch over to the PowerPoint. I'm beginning. All right, so it is the live workshop with me, Lorna Lewis, from Planning, Publishing, and Profiting. I am your accountability partner, and I am also a writing coach. So this workshop is for you, and you pretty much know it's for you because you join, but it's for you if you have a book idea and you don't know how to start, or you may have started writing and you just don't know where to go next, or maybe you're ready to learn more about planning, publishing, and making money from your book. So tell me if this sounds like you. Are you always talking or thinking about the book idea that you have? Or you get excited about writing a book and then nothing happens? Or maybe you, know the, you don't know the first thing about writing, but you want to learn. Perhaps you sit down to write but can't get past the first few sentences. Or you may have even written a book and you just don't know what to do in terms of publishing it. Maybe you can't seem to squeeze writing into your already busy schedule, which we all have. <laughs> or you're not sure if your story ideal is marketable, which is a valid concern. Maybe you're constantly questioning if you can really pull this off, if you can really write this book. Or you're not sure who's your ideal reader, who are you writing this book for? So in the next two hours, I'm going to share how to find the right outline for your book, how to publish your book the right way and to avoid the mistakes that I made in the beginning, and how to make sure you're promoting your book to the right readers. Because if you don't have the right readers, they're not going to purchase your book. So you have to make sure you're publishing and promoting to people who actually want to read your story. Oh, hi, Tarva. I am going, hold on. I need to go back. I skipped some slides. Yes. So my promise to you, and I apologize, y'all. I came outside because I kept, Every time I do a workshop, I drive my family out of the living room and they're stuck in the room for like hours. So I came out here so that they can just have free range of the house. So please let me know if you can't hear me or if you know anything is too distracting and I'll try to shift or something. So my promise to you is a clear understanding of what it takes to plan, publish, and profit your book successfully. And once you develop the right mindset, you'll have clarity on the story you want to tell, how to develop it into a best-selling novel, and identify your ideal reader. You'll feel more confident in your ability to actually write your book, and you'll master the art of promoting and marketing your book the right way, because that's where the money comes from. So let's dig in. Who am I, for those of you who don't know me, I have been coaching or teaching for over 16 years. I self-published my first novel, Dirty Little Secrets, in 2009. I went from selling very little, my first book, to making it to the bestsellers list by my third book. I've coached aspiring authors, everything from becoming a national bestselling author, how to plan their book, how to promote their book, how to market their book, where to publish their book, all of that good stuff. I've had the opportunity to attend a lot of workshops um, who were hosted by not only national best-selling authors, but also New York Times best-selling authors. And the things that I'm about to share with you, I've heard at pretty much all of these workshops. So these are also the lessons that I applied in working within my third novel, the one that made it to the bestsellers list. Um, and it worked for me. So I have no doubt that it will work for you. 
So the first thing is, what story are you telling? You have to be clear on the story that you have in mind to tell because that drives your whole everything. Everything depends on the story that you're telling. So if you're not clear on your story, then your reader won't be clear on the story as well. And you do not need readers who are confused by what you're trying to share. So think about a movie. Have you ever sat and watched a movie or read a book and you, just, you, you had no idea where are they going with this? What is the purpose for this? Why did they even write this? That's what you don't want to hear about your book. After you poured all your blood, sweat, and tears in it, you want to hear good things. And this is the easiest good thing you can hear, that they understood what you were doing. So even if it wasn't a book for them, they could still understand your story. So what's your story's theme? Every story has a theme. The theme is the overall idea that shapes the story. The theme determines how your characters are behaving. Your theme determines the situations they will find themselves in and how they get themselves out of it. It also determines how your story ends. So I chose The Lion King because it's a popular story that even if you didn't see it, you probably know enough about it to understand theme. So the theme from The Lion King is family. The theme is good versus evil. The theme is envy and overcoming adversity, which shows you that a story can have more than one theme. And this is my story, um, my last novel, Double Down and Dirty. So the theme in my novel, based on the characters, Jade, who is a main character, her main theme was trust. So everything Jade did in the beginning showed she lacked trust. She did not trust um, me and Mo mainly, and you see that throughout the story, and you also see how she worked through that issue of trust. So you have no doubt that Jade have trust issues. Sean's main theme is acceptance. Everything he does in the beginning of the story shows that he has a hard time opening up and accepting new people as well, which also can be a trust issue. So you see how Sean is standoffish you see how he handles business how he handles his friends and family and all of that is shaped around his theme and you also see how he worked through his theme and the other the end how he was able to overcome that thing um betrayal is adrian's theme so again in the beginning you already see that adrian has been betrayed you see how everything she does is um in response to her feeling of being betrayed, even though it was so many years ago. So these are some common themes that stories could be based on. A story could be based on friendship. And you will see how, you know, everything they do is based on friendship, if that's the main theme of the story. So you have to think about your characters and really think about what, what, what's the main goal for them? What's the theme for them? What is the thing that they are trying to overcome? And everything they do in the beginning is based on that theme because a good story will show how they got there, how they worked through it, and the, the happily ever after, if there is a happily ever after. Okay. I put this out here because a lot of people I've had the privilege of speaking with all have these great ideas and all want to write a book. And they really can, but I wanted to show you, like Robert Frost reminds us that the road less travel is the one that gives us the greatest reward. And there are 97% of people who started writing the book, but only 3% actually finished their book. And I don't want you to be in that 97%. They have enough members. I want you to be in that 3% who start and finish your book. So how you're going to create a writing routine. This sounds, you know, I'm pretty sure you've already heard this. You know you need to do it. But needing and knowing and actually doing are different things. So I'm going to show you some tips on creating a writing routine. So morning for me is usually the best time to write. Everything that I've been reading, when in reading about routines and writing routines, most people 
dedicate their mornings to writing. That's because writing is going to be one of those things that is going to be put on the back burner as your day gets started. You have work, you may have kids and, you know, church and neighborhood obligations, whatever it may be. All of these things are going to take precedence over you actually sitting down to write. So if you know that your lifestyle throughout the day is not set up for writing, then maybe wake up a little earlier and write. And it's also before, you know, your brain get clogged up with everything that you need to do for today. Let that be the first thing you do. And it gives you a feeling of accomplishment because you've actually did it. You sat down, you wrote, and you got that done all day. You're a feeling accomplished because you got, you got your writing done and you're not stressing about, I need to sit down and write, but I got to do this. I need to sit down and write, but I got to do that. It's out of the way. The next thing you can do in creating a routine is set the scene. Make it special. Don't make it a chore. Make it enjoyable. Burn you some candles. Put your, your writing music on. Grab you some wine or coffee or tea or whatever it is that you enjoy. Make it a routine, but make it a special routine. Make it something that you actually look forward to doing. Next is choosing a quiet space that's just for writing. I talked about this before. I don't know if you all may have heard it, but um, I read where it talks about the brain and how our brain get used to routines and how our brain get used to certain places for certain things. For example, the tape, kitchen table. Um, in the thing that I was reading, it said that you should not have children doing homework at the kitchen table. Why? Because the table is for eating, especially if that's where they eat. Because once they sit down, now they're hungry. Because this is where we sit to eat. And the brain is trained to, you know, remember that this is where we eat. So wherever place you choose, make it your writing spot. You know, make it comfortable, make it quiet, and that's your writing spot. So every time you get there, your brain automatically clicks into creative mode because this is where we write, and it knows that. Writing time is your uninterrupted time. So make sure it's a time where you don't have to worry about the phone ringing all day. You don't have to worry about people coming over, the children. You know, when I wrote my first novel, Dirty Little Secrets, I did not write in the morning. I wrote it that night. But my children were smaller, so I was able to feed them, do homework, put them to bed, and then devote my nighttime to writing, which work then doesn't really work now. So, um but it was uninterrupted time for me. And I wrote that novel in about a month because I wrote every night. Next is to organize yourself and to make the most of your time. Make sure you have everything that you need right there. I have a lot of writing reference books that I use, um, notes that I may have taken and need to bring with me while I'm writing, those kind of things I need to make sure I have right there ready. I don't have to get up, look for this, do this. I'm making the most of my writing time. Okay, so how much time should you devote to writing? Well, of course, this depends on your schedule and it also depends on your expected release date, which even if you have not started writing, you should have one in mind because it gives you something to work towards. Um, think about, I always tell people that they may wanna think about a special date. Of course, be realistic. If you are trying to write a novel, I would not say, say September 1st, I wanna release this novel because that's very, very, very unlikely. But choose some time, you know, for out, give yourself at least a year and think about a special date that you would like to write this novel and put it out. That way you're able to say, then I need to devote X amount of time each day to writing this novel. These um, are word counts based on major publishing companies. And these are the number of words they expect to see based on the genre that you are writing in. So if you are writing a short story, then it would be 1,000 to 8,000 words, a novella, 20,000 to 50,000 words, and so on. So I know a lot of people are either interested in novel writing, which is 50 to 110,000 words, um, or middle, school, middle grade, maybe 30 to 50,000, picture books, 500 to 600 words. I would advise staying either on the lower end or somewhere in the middle. I would not advise the higher end because the longer your book is, the more people are going to, they're going to have to really 
they're going to question it and they're going to have to really decide if they're going to want to devote that much time to reading unless you are like a very very well-known author that they already know and they already have a relationship with and they know they're going to love this book so if it's 2,000 pages whatever this is my favorite author but that's not us yet so just try to keep your book you know, at a range where people feel are, you know, feel like, okay, I can read this in a good amount of time, but also make it worth their money. You would not want to give them a $20,000 um, book and say it's a novel and charge a novel price because they're not really going to pay that. So next is to identify your audience. Who will want to read your story? And this is going to help you while you're writing. So if you have not started already, you need to think about who is this story for? Thinking about that will help you when it comes to the language that you're using. If you're writing for a younger crowd, then you're going to try to use language that's more on their style, that's more, you know, something that they can relate to. Um, if it's for an older crowd, you're going to use language that they can relate to. So that's very important and i'm so sorry about these birds i promise y'all it was quiet when i first came out here next is to create the right plot your audience will help you with your plot you do not want to create a plot for an audience that don't even understand what you're talking about that it defeats the point the purpose of your whole book so you're writing you deciding on your um audience and you're writing for them do these people like to see a lot of drama then you're going to give them a lot of drama. Do these people like happy endings? Then you're going to give them a happy ending. So that really helps you when you're writing, knowing what your audience like and who they are. It helps to set the scene. If, you know, if you're talking about someplace that mainly parents will know about and you're saying, okay, but this, this book is for young kids, they, they, it's going to go right over their head. Um, it also helps you decide where are you going to advertise your book. You know, if you're writing a Christian fiction book, then you can't go to the church and you can advertise there. You know, you can promote there. You may do a book talk there. If it's erotica, you wouldn't necessarily want to go to a church. So, you know, knowing where to find your people will help you advertise to the right people and go to the right people to promote and have events. Also, next, which events to attend? You know, if you're writing a children's book, then you wouldn't necessarily go to a singles event you know, if they have vendors there because they may, they may or may not have children. And if they do have children at that event, they're not expected to go and purchase a children's book. Um, and what genre you need to write. So deciding who your audience is, if you know, again, if you have an audience that really love a happy ever after that, usually fall into romance. So you may want to decide, okay, well, this is a romance genre, a romance novel. So research. Research is key. These are actual um, what are the, reviews from Amazon that I found. I use one book for at least two of the um, two of the reviews. So the first one I highlighted. These review these books are the ones that I'm showing you now. These are the zero. These books receive a zero review. Now, let me preface that by saying, of course, all books are not going to appeal to all people. Some people may purchase books based on, you know, a, a comment or based on a, the advice of someone else, and they just didn't get what the other person may have gotten from it. So you really do have to be mindful of that. But if I see certain things coming up over and over again, then most likely that's an issue that the author had with the book. So the first thing I highlighted was, it seems as if it were very hurriedly and sloppily thrown together, waiting for it to get good, kept waiting for it to get good. That was the one review from the one book, and this was the next review from that same book, Rushed. Women were too stupid to be believable, very unrealistic at times. And this was the next one, part of the book dragged on too long, too over the top, senseless, and the next, well, actually, this one was the same book, Predictable Ending Cliché. So if I'm seeing that over and over again, then I would know that something, somewhere along the lines, the author 
dropped the ball in terms of really taking her time and developing this story. It seems like she rushed through certain parts of the story. So if you're reading this review, you will keep that in mind while you're writing your work, remembering that, okay, I can't rush through it. I really have to go in depth. I really have to go in detail and give my readers what they want. They want believable characters. They want the book to really feel natural. They don't want it to be over the top. They don't want it to feel like you just rushed through and through some words together. So you really want to keep that in mind. And this is for a fiction novel. So this was a, these were five star reviews. Characters have evolved, structured perfectly. No character was left bland. Um, the next one was hook her readers from beginning to end. Pacing was written in a way that left the reader savoring every word. Like the secondary characters. And I'm going to pause there because especially if you are a fiction novel writer. Let me tell you that most fiction novel writers who write series do really, really, really well. Because think about a television show or a soap opera. People really get invested in these characters. So you may find that your first novel may do okay. But if you write another novel by, you know, based on these same characters, but a different plot, then you are going to get more readers because the people who really like that novel, your first one, are going to recommend it to other people. Let me check that. Oh, I found something on the web about. I don't know why that happened. So um, writing in series is a really, really, really good thing. So I highlighted like the secondary characters, because if you are writing a novel and you do plan to write more on this novel or more another, you know, a series with this novel, don't leave your secondary characters behind. You have to develop them enough, not that they're taking over the story, but that they, the reader have interest, has interest in them now. So, you know, really let us know who these people are, even though they are not main characters. We should still know enough about them. So if your next book, they're the main character, well, we already know some background about them and we're already interested in them. So that's some advice for our secondary characters. Um, the next one was, it feels so real. And another one, again, feels so real, natural. So doing this, like I said, shows you from a reader's perspective, what they want to see, what they do not want to see. And you, like I said, will remember this as you're writing your book. Um, these are also things that your editor should catch once you go into the editing phase. If the book feels rushed, you should work with an editor. Your editor should be good enough to tell you, okay, no, you have to slow this down, add more detail here. That's the developmental editor's job. So this is a review for nonfiction. These are zero reviews. Um, felt no emotional connection. Too technical. See, a lot of times people feel like if it's nonfiction that they have to use these big words to really prove that they know what they're talking about because they're the expert, but readers don't want that. Many of them don't. Some of them, like this apparently was a cancer survivor. Well, a cancer survivor is very different from a cancer doctor you know, or someone who really studies cancer. So a cancer survivor would want to read language that they truly understand. Next is didn't capture my interest. So that one, again, is kind of subjective because it could have just not been their type of book. Um, stop reading, stop repeating himself. Again, remember I did the... Um, workshop on Facebook, the Wednesday workshop with unnecessary words, because we tend to say stuff over and over again, thinking we are really driving the point home, which is okay if you are giving a speech. But if you are writing a book, the readers don't want to read stuff over and over again. I don't care how many different ways you say it, just say it and then let them you know, if they need to go back and reread it, let them do that. But don't keep saying the same stuff over and over again. Um, the same book, a different review, repetitive and outlandish. So again, this person gave it a zero because they didn't want to keep reading the same thing over and over again. So as you're going through your book, and it may not be as soon as you write it, because here's the thing. When you write your book, you should write it. You should put it away for at least a week. 
pick it up again and read through it again. Then you're looking at it from a different eye, a fresher eye, and you're able to pick up on things that you missed the first time you're writing because you know what you meant to say. And in your mind, that's what you said. So if you put it down and come back to it a week or so later, you're able to read and realize, oh, I didn't say that. I didn't mean to say it that way. Or, oh, I said that so many times. So, you know, it's different. So you should do that before you even send it to an editor. Uh, the next one is poorly written, embellished from the man himself. And this was written, that, was, that one was from a book, a nonfiction book based on a real a person. Someone else was writing the book about this person. So they're saying we know him well enough to know that this book may embellish. And if you're writing a nonfiction book, they expect the truth. Not you, you know, they don't want you to heighten it or anything to make it more interesting in that aspect. Take, you know, in terms of changing who the character really is. Um, next has not been edited. And let me tell you, readers are so not friendly when they have paid their money for your book and it is riddled in mistakes. They hate it and they will not let you live it down and they will go on and on about it and they will tell other people. Editing is the part that you should not shortchange yourself on at all. Please make sure you invest the money needed for a good editor because they are going to help you make or break your book. Okay, moving on. Five stars held my interest, very readable. Need not be a scholar to understand. So the language was very understandable, even though it was a nonfiction book. Next, effortless to read. Never tedious or boring. Interesting, entertaining, and informative. Written wonderfully, honest, and devastating. Writes like she feels, pulls at my heartstrings. And this, I thought, I thought was very, very important because a lot of times nonfiction novels are looked at as maybe boring and you know oh it's just you know to learning purposes people don't really think of nonfiction novels as entertaining and easy to read and engaging which they can be just like fiction novels so you know if you're writing a nonfiction book just remember that people even in nonfiction they want to be entertained they want to be able to pick up your book and feel like they cannot put it down Bring your story to life. This is probably my favorite because I love creating a scene. Bring your story to life. That is, if I can click on it. Okay, so this is from my book, Double Down and Dirty. Um, I just highlighted or bold printed the, the terms where I felt like you, I was really describing this scene. So for the first one, and this is how it starts off, a visit to hell would have felt better. Now, I could have simply said Jade was angry. Jade didn't want to go there. But I felt like a visit to hell would have felt better really showed you how much she did not want to be where she was. The next one, the cool air that greeted her. So you know, you can feel this cool air and greeted her. Apparently, as soon as she walked in, she felt that air. So I could have said as soon as she walked through the door, the air, she felt air. But the cool air greeted her, really brought it to life more. Um, the next thing I had in bold was a raven-haired receptionist. I could have said a red-headed receptionist. But that wouldn't have been quite as impressive as a raven-haired receptionist. So, and I'm not saying you have to be all fancy with your words like that. But what I am saying is, set the scene and really describe it in a way that lets us feel like we are there. Don't just tell us that it was cold. Tell us that the windows felt like they were frozen, you know, so, something like that. Or your fingers felt like they were about to fall off. It was so cold. So really, really, really help us to feel what these characters are feeling. Even if you are writing nonfiction. So again, from um, Double Down and Dirty is um, in her condo, dark, shiny wood floors against the white walls gave off a rich yet cozy feel. I'm telling you, I'm showing you, I'm sorry, what her apartment looked like without saying, 
there were dark wood floors and white walls and Jay felt very cozy. That you, okay. So uh, you, Rita may be thinking, Anne, what's the point? Um, next, um, Crimson Living Room said in her color scheme of red, orange, and a splash of yellow here and there. Again, I am showing you what her apartment looked like. But not only am I showing you what it looked like, there's a purpose. I said um, at the next sentence, she loved bright spaces. And if she had to guess, she'd say her sperm donor was the exact opposite. So it's not just that I'm showing you this um, apartment, but there's a purpose for me showing you this apartment because I'm letting you know how opposite she is from her father and how much she dislikes her father in calling him a sperm donor, obviously. So in setting the scene, make it meaningful. Don't just, you know, tell us how everything is. And I gave you an example, an example in your workbook where I talked about a kitchen and I talked about the, um, the, mar the tile floors and the marble countertop and the stainless steel appliances. And in your workbook, I just really just named everything in the kitchen. Well, uh, that was one example. The next example was that she walked into the kitchen that she used to love, and I don't know it verbatim, but something like this. She walked into the kitchen that she used to love. Her heels clicked against the marble floors. She admired the stainless steel appliances that at one time stole her heart. The chandelier above the marble, above the marble table, um, held special meaning of a happier time. So it's not just that I am telling you what the kitchen looked like, but I am using the things in the kitchen to set the scene and to show how my character is feeling. Because when I said um, the chandelier above the marble table reminded her of happier times, then you know that something is going on in her life that is not so happy right now. So make it meaningful. Make your words count, even in setting your scene. Okay. Another one, dimly lit area, the thrum of conversation and the sounds of five-star meals being served echoed from every point of the elegant restaurant. So that shows you, shows you that as he's walking in this restaurant, he hears the sound. And you, if you've been to a restaurant, you've heard these sounds of people eating, of, of utensils clicking and um, people in the back cooking. If you can see the kitchen, I hear the kitchen. So it brings you in and it's also places that you've been. So you can really put yourself in that story. The dark hair beauty in a red dress. Okay, you can see this lady in dark hair and her red dress. The next one, the smell of bacon. I don't have to go into detail about the smell of bacon because we all, hopefully, most of us that would read this would know what bacon smells like. So you already know, okay, she's waking up to the smell of bacon. It's a familiar smell. Try to use familiar. Try to stay away from nasty smells. Readers don't really like that. So try to use good smells that can draw them in, like the scent of vanilla, peach, or, you know, whatever it is for you. Um, his queen size bed held her captive. So you already know in this room is a queen size bed. She's laying in the bed. She obviously can't get up because she feels like she's being held captive. I could have simply said she felt like she couldn't move, but I wanted to really bring the reader in to the story. Um, carrying a cup of steaming hot coffee. He's doing something. You can see him standing with coffee, hot coffee. Um, his dark blue briefs. He's standing by the bed, dark blue briefs, holding his cup of coffee with steam coming from it. I am painting the picture, but it also has meaning. Of course, it's hard for you to see that it has meaning with just this little part. But as you read it, you will see that there's a purpose for everything that I'm telling. Okay. And I hope that that makes sense. Do you all have any questions about anything I've said so far? If not, I will continue. Okay. No all right. So next is to make your sentences simple and easy to understand. Again, that goes back to when I talked about the nonfiction book. 
your nonfiction books. A lot of times people feel like, you know, they have to use these big words. And I do. I use the thesaurus only because I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm looking for different words, yet words that people automatically recognize when they read it. So even though it's different, like if I said, if I use, I did, I use crimson instead of red. Most people know that that's a shade of red. So, you know, still make sure that your your words and your sentences are easy to read and they flow. Make them flow. And when I say flow, that means your readers are just reading, reading, reading. They don't have to stop. They don't have to look up any words. They don't have to reread it again to see what you meant. It's just that simple. Write short chapters. I did this with my first novel, not even realizing I was doing it, but I'm so glad that I did. My first novel, um, Dirty Little Secrets, was about maybe five or five to seven pages per chapter, maybe a little longer in some chapters. But what I heard from a lot of readers, and like I said, I didn't even realize I did it until the readers started telling me how, you know, they were so into the book. And then they will see that it's only a few pages in the next chapter. So they felt like, okay, I can read these few pages and then I'll be done. But every chapter left with a cliffhanger, ended with a cliffhanger. So then it's like, oh, shoot. Okay, the next chapter is only five more pages. I'm going to just read this and then I'll be done. And before they know it, they're almost finished with the book in one sitting. That's what you want your readers to feel. If they pick up a book and they're 20-something, 30-something pages in a chapter, Nine times out of 10, their, their schedules are going to tell them, you do not have time to get into this book because it's 30 pages in this chapter and what they hate is having to stop in the middle of a chapter and start back up again because who knows when they'll be able to pick it back up again and now they're lost. So if your chapters are shorter, then they're able to read them in one city. And you know if they have to pick the book back up again later, then that's fine, but at least they made it through that chapter. So try your best to keep your chapters between five to 10 pages. I, I would not go over 10 pages. Draw your readers in from the very first sentence. The very first sentence, because other than your book cover and the back of your book, the next thing your readers are gonna do is open it and read your first page. If that first sentence don't hook them, they're putting it back and they're moving on to another book because they are looking for something that they're going to pick up and be captivated by at the very beginning. I know because I do the same thing. And um, I was sharing with one of my clients the other day about my, when I first started writing Dirty Little Secrets, because I wrote it on a whim. I was writing, a, I was working on a workbook for children and I just wanted to keep writing, but I couldn't make their stories long. So I said, I'm gonna try and write a story. Of course it had to be about a school teacher because I was a school teacher at the time. So I wrote that book. I think I may have written two or three chapters by the time my husband came home. I read chapter one to him and he said, oh, okay that's boring and <laughs> of course my little feelings were crushed because i thought it was really good and then i told him but it gets better wait you got to keep listening it gets better and he said but who's going to keep reading if it's boring at in the beginning and it was like the light bulb went off at that moment because i've always been an avid reader i've always needed to be captivated at the beginning so why then did I think my readers would want to read Bored in the beginning and keep reading for the interesting part? I know I have to capture them right then, but I didn't. So I tossed that aside and I started from where it got interesting and that's where I started. Started with the high points and then moved on from there. So here are some examples of some first sentences. The first one, Amy was hesitant to open the room door, afraid of what she may find. Right then, you like, I wanna know what she gonna find too. Next, she had been watching her neighbor's house for weeks and was surprised to find out what happened behind those doors. Next, Dan reached for his keys, but remembered the time. Traffic would hold him up and he had no time to lose. And my heart wouldn't stop. My heart wouldn't stop racing as I watched my biggest secret play out on the 10 o'clock news. Now, if I picked up a book and I saw, I read 
either one of these as the first sentence. I'm going to keep reading. And if the author is just as dramatic throughout the story as he or she is with that first sentence, I'm going to keep reading. And I'm going to tell other people about this great book. That is what you want your readers to do for you. But you have to capture them like that. Again, attention spans are short. If you don't capture them, they're just like you. We are like children. If we don't capture them in the beginning, we have lost them. And we do not want to lose them. Remember to teach and entertain, which goes back to the nonfiction books, because mainly nonfiction books are written to teach a lesson or well to teach a lesson. Yeah. So you also want to entertain them. It doesn't mean you have to be funny to entertain. Entertaining could also mean setting the scene, like I said. So um, you're not just saying everything. You're writing where your reader is seeing, is feeling what you're going through, like they are right there with you. That's entertaining them. So apply fiction rules to nonfiction writing. What does this mean? Outlining your story. Outlining your story, A, it helps you to stay focused. Um, there are, I have planner versus panster, and I'm going to explain to you what that is. A planner is just what it says. It's someone who is planning their story. They have to sit down. They have to plan it out from the beginning to the end in order for them to write their story. They outline. A panster is someone like myself who just sit down and write. I don't outline. I just write because my story, my characters still drive my story. My characters still tell my story. So when I tell people, I don't know how this story is going to end. I'm not just saying it. I truly don't know how the story is going to end because I'm writing, I'm creating as I go. So what happened in chapter one dictates chapter two. That helps with chapter three. So I don't know until I write it. Some people cannot do that. Some people cannot do outlines. So you have to figure out what works for you. The reason I put this here is because a lot of people, especially people who are doing nonfiction or memoirs, feel like, okay, well, this story is about me, so I don't need to sit down and plan it. But it also helps you fill in gaps that you may miss while you're writing because you're so emotionally involved in the writing. So again, you have to figure out which works best for you. Are you going to plan or are you just going to write? If you feel like you can just write, then by all means, because I do. So there are several different outlines. There's the traditional outline, which you may remember from middle and high school, where you have your big idea, then you have your A and your Roman noodle, noodles, Roman numerals. <laughs> so that's the traditional outline. It still works. If you want to do the traditional way, if you are indeed a planner, there's something called the snowflake method. Uh, this one is very complicated. So I would suggest if you are a planner and you really want to know more about planning and different methods of planning, I would suggest reading on it and seeing if it's um, the outline for you because it's very, very detailed. This, the snowflake method will take you about a week or two of just planning. So with it, it starts, you start with one sentence, a very short sentence, a summary, but it's only one sentence. Then you take that summary, that one sentence summary, and you turn it, you expand it into a paragraph. Then you take that paragraph and you pull out your characters from that paragraph and you write a one page storyline for each character. After that, you expand the summary into um, the summary from... Number one, you expand that into a paragraph. And your final paragraph will tell how the story ends. So like I said, it's very detailed. I didn't even put all the steps on here because you may feel like me, like, no, that's just too much. But if you are one of those people who, some people swear by this method because they are people who just have to have every single detail planned down to the last sentence. That's just not me. But if it's you, then you may want to look at the snowflake method and read about it and see if it'll work for you and your story.
There's also mind mapping, which I got from writingforsuccess.com. And we, I used to know this, and you probably did too, as a bubble map. So what it is is you put the um, your title in the middle, and then you break, you, each bubble is broken down. So like they have the main characters, hurdles that the character's going through, the final problem, the character development, how you're going to really develop this character, and then your, um, your other characters. So this is, I also knew this as brain dumping. And basically what it is, is just getting it all out on paper so that you can see it in front of you and then try and organize it, you know, however you want with your story. Again, this is one that if I were you, if you were interested in, you may want to go back, read over it, see if that's something that'll work for you. If you have tried to write your story and you just can't, you feel like you keep getting stuck, then I would definitely recommend you try some form of outline. Now, what I have done and still do to this day is I do a, um, what did I call it? A scene, a chapter outline. So basically what it is, is I would just write um, who, what to, who, ugh, I'm sorry, y'all, the characters that are in that chapter, whose point of view that chapter is being told from, where the setting is, um, what else, the setting and the, the, the sensory details for that chapter. What are they seeing in this chapter? What are they hearing in this chapter? What are they smelling in this chapter? If they can smell anything, tasting if they're out eating. I'm doing that because I need to keep up with what I've already used, um, whose point of view this story is being told from, because my books, it's the last book anyway, was told from three different points of views, but that was per chapter. So my first chapter started off with Jade, and you knew from reading that chapter that it was from Jay's point of view. And this is off, and I'm sorry, but while I'm thinking about it, I need to tell you what I'm telling you now. Point of view, because I did not put, put it in here, but I should have. Point of view is, whose eyes are we seeing this story from? And if you are writing a novel, and if you have more than one main character in the novel, then each character will be assigned a chapter. And if I am writing a chapter based on Jay's point of view, then that means everything that is seen in that chapter, everything that is heard in that chapter, everything that is tasted in that chapter is through Jay. Um, you will not hear uh, Sean's thoughts in that chapter unless Jade was a mind reader. And since she's not, I would not hear what Sean was thinking because Jay can't read Sean's mind. I could um, maybe say what she thought he was thinking or what his facial expression showed he must have been thinking, but not what he was definitely thinking. And the same thing when I move on to Sean's chapter. Sean's chapter may be the same setting if they were out to dinner. Maybe the first chapter I chose to tell it from Jay's point of view. The second chapter now is Sean's point of view. Maybe the same conversation, but now he's showing what he's seen. It's from his viewpoint, how he feels about what Jade is saying. So I had a big problem with point of view when I first started writing. I did not learn about it until my second and third novel, and I'm so glad that I did. But it's definitely something you want to be mindful of while you're reading because it is so easy to get so caught up in this chapter, in the writing of the chapter, that you switch points of views, and now you're telling us Sean thoughts, and it's Jade's point of view. So... I just wanted to say that while it was on my mind, since it's not a part of the outline. Okay, it's 6.50. We are doing great. Um, next, and again, I do apologize for my bird friends. I stated at the beginning, if you did not hear me, that I came out here because I keep um, locking my family up and in their rooms, and now they're able to just be in the house without me telling them to be quiet and everything. But now it's loud out here. So anyway, moving on. <laughs> Um, write in dialogue. Now, remember this part is about applying fiction rules to nonfiction writing. Nonfiction writers a lot of times feel like they're just telling a story. 
and they're writing it and it's from their point of view and they're telling us what their mom said and they're telling us what their dad said and they're just saying mom said this dad said that like this example that i use i remember the day my mom told me my dad passed away she said he was ready to go and he went peacefully in his sleep well that's telling us okay we get it we understand that but she could have easily have said the call from my mom still plays in my head hello i answered the phone crystal it's mom her voice was low and shaky i have some bad news your dad passed my whole body went numb crystal are you there i shook my head as if she could see me through the phone it's okay honey he was ready he passed peacefully in his sleep same information but now i'm putting it in dialogue form so that my readers are able to really come into my world uh it's it's the difference between it's the difference between me sharing this story with you and me inviting you into the story with me so now it's you sitting there watching as she's picking up this phone her mom you know on the phone you see her facial expression you see that her body's going limp and you know she you see her shaking her head but she's not saying anything you don't necessarily know what her mom is saying on the end of the phone unless she's on speakerphone but you are there you are in this with her and that's how readers like to feel like they are sitting right there with you think about reality shows reality shows are very very famous now are doing so well because people like to be invited into their world people like to see what's going on that's why um vloggers people who do youtube videos are so um successful because they're showing you their everyday life things that they're doing and people just like to do that they just like to watch so invite them in and let them watch don't just sit them down and tell them your point of view invite them in and let them see it for themselves surprise your audience even though you are writing a nonfiction book, because this is applying nonfiction rules to nonfiction writing, even though your book may be nonfiction, you still want to leave them with an element of surprise. Yes, they may know the purpose of the book. For example, if you were writing a book on um, how you overcame a divorce, so they know at the end, you know, you got a divorce. So that wouldn't be a surprise for them. But maybe some events leading up to the divorce may take them by surprise and you don't want to just put it out there you want them you want to build them up to it so that when they read it it's like what oh i didn't see that coming at all that readers love the element of surprise give it to them if if you can it depends on what you're writing but if you can give them that surprise element don't take that away from them. okay create a catchy title so these are three of my um covers you've really got a hold on me double down and dirty and dirty little secrets so based on my titles and the cover people are able to see that you know clearly from you really got a hold on me just based on the title and based on the the picture you know that this is a love story double down and dirty you can pretty much imagine that this has something to do with this woman and it's dirty whatever it is dirty little secrets is self-explanatory and you also want books whether it's fiction or non-fiction you want your cover to make your readers stop and pay attention because that is the first thing they're going to see unless they just know you and they know you wrote this book but if you're not an event for example, a few weeks ago, I did the Zeta Boule in New Orleans. I cannot tell you how many people stopped because they saw this Dirty Little Secrets cover. This cover will always make people stop. And this is a new cover, but even the cover before, which were just lips, always made people stop, pick it up, and want to see what it's about. That's what you want. Whether you're writing a fiction book or a nonfiction book or a children's book, you still want it now depend, you know, of course it's going to be likable to your audience. So if it's a children's book, think about what children like. What would make them stop? What would make them want to pick this book up and bring it to their mom and say, I want this book? Think about that as you're creating your cover, as you're creating your title. You have to capture them from the beginning. But also remembering that you don't want your book to be misleading. You want your title 
to kind of say, you know, give an, your audience an uh, idea of what your book is about without giving it away. But you would not write um, dirty. I would not write dirty little secrets if it's a um, Christian book. Not that it's a dirty, dirty book, but it's not going to attract the same audience. If an audience is looking for a Christian book, they're not going to pick up Dirty Little Secrets. But if an audience is looking for a, a good story that they feel like, oh, this is something I look like I can get into, then they're going to pick it up. So make sure it's also fitting for the story that you're telling and for the audience that you are hoping to attract. Okay, research when it comes to your title. Go to the library, go to bookstores, go to Amazon, look for books in your genre. You're not going to steal their title, even though there are like maybe five or six dirty little secret books out there. It, you know, titles are, you can't copyright a title. You cannot copyright, I mean, trademark. You can't trademark a title. So people can use it. And, you know, especially common titles like that. So, um, but you can get an idea and you can change it around to fit your story. Think about a movie that you like, a song title or, you know, lyrics from a song. Those are ways that you can kind of, that can kind of help you think about a title for your book. Because I think that is the most stressful part. <laughs> After you've written a book, trying to think of the perfect title. Um, jot down words that come to mind. When I wrote Dirty Little Secrets, I did not have a title until the very end. Like the book was completely written when I had a title. And it did not come to me until I was talking with a friend and I was telling her, you know, I was kind of telling her about the book because she hadn't read it. Only a few people knew I was writing. So I shared with her that I'd written this book and I was telling her about the book. I said, and it's about the husband and he's trying to cover up all these dirty little secrets. And that was it. Soon as it came out, that was it. I said, that's my title. So you also may want to find a confidant that you can talk with and, you know, just kind of bounce ideas off of and they'll help you tell you, oh, girl, yeah, that's it. Or no, nah, uh -uh, keep trying. So someone you can trust that you know that's going to really lead you in the right direction. Um, where to publish your book? I'm sorry, y'all. They are really having too much fun in my house right now. Where to publish your book? There are online sites where you will publish your book. Now, all of this is in the um, all of this is in the workbook. CreateSpace is the company that I use to publish my books. I self-publish, but CreateSpace um, prints them, so they're the printing company that I use. Um. Amazon is also a publishing company. Now you can upload your book directly to Amazon, your cover directly to Amazon, and your readers are able to purchase. Uh, Lulu is a company that also published books, and Book Baby is a company that published books. So you may want to kind of look at those. They're very, very easy to use, very easy to use. Um, this is what you want to avoid when you're publishing your book. Vanity Press Publishers. Let me tell you what's going to happen. When I first published Dirty Little Secrets, I started getting phone calls. I started getting emails. I started getting um, mail, physical mail, from companies who were anxious to publish my book. So they were calling and they were saying, we see you have this book out and we want to publish this book for you. And we can guarantee that this book will be in all these major bookstores and all these major online stores. And we're going to help you sell thousands of copies. And they promise you everything an author wants to hear. The only thing you have to do is pay us all this money and we're going to do all of this for you. Now, Everything they're promising they are going to do for you are things that you can do yourself. You can upload it yourself. The company is going to print it. You can pub promote it and market it yourself because they're not really going to do as much as they're promising you they're going to do. 
they want the money more than they want you to have a successful book. And that's just the truth. That's been my experience and experience with people who use these companies. So please be very, very mindful of that. I'm not saying that they're bad because they will help. They will print your book. They will help you get your book out. They will do all of that. But do not sign with these people thinking that you're going to be very, very successful because they're going to do all of this work. They're not. But the same thing goes for major publishing companies as well. This is your book. No one's going to market it and promote it like you. Even if you sign with a major publishing company, they are looking for you to really sell this book, which is why you really need to start building a following now. If even though you don't have a book, if you are writing a nonfiction or fiction book and it is on a certain topic, go ahead and start putting stuff out there. Create an author, well, it, you don't even have to call it an author page. You could just create a page based on that topic and have people joining that page that are interested in that topic. And you share your wisdom in on that page and you've built a following before you've even published a book. Now you have an audience that's right there. And if you say, hey guys, I'm about to write this book, I'm about to publish this book, whatever you're about to do at that time, you already have people waiting to get their hands on your work because they trust you, they know you know what you're talking about, and they are already invested in you. And I really went ahead because I talked about that later, but I wanted to say it there. So anyway, um, also avoid overpricing your book. Oh, did I make this mistake? I had dub Dirty Little Secrets, the ebook for Dirty Little Secrets was priced at $9.99. I knew no better. I saw some books priced at $9.99. They were about the same um, length in, in the same genre. So I felt like, okay, $9.99 must be the going thing. But then my third book, I started working with the um, coach. And she said, go online, go to Amazon, find some of your favorite authors, authors who are New York Times bestselling authors or national bestselling authors and see what their books are priced as. So I did. And they're like $4.99, $5.99. And my book, no, who no one really even knew about, was $9.99. Make sure you are not pricing your book so high that you, won't get, that you don't get any sales. And I know $4.99, I know you're probably thinking, that's all, $3.99, $4.99. But if you're selling an ebook, that's really the going price, depending on the page number. You will find that you are gonna do a lot better in terms of sales when it comes to actually attending events and selling hard copy, I mean, paperback copies of your book. Because then you're able to sell them, you know, fifteen, maybe twenty dollars. So, you know, but your ebooks are going to be around three ninety nine to four ninety nine, maybe five ninety nine. Budget wisely. A lot of people I talk to want to write a book, want to publish a book, but they have no idea how much it truly costs to do that. So these are just some estimated costs for um, different things that you would need to do for your book. Editing. Editors can be as low as $3 a page, as high as $10 a page. Depending on the editor, it could get up to 11, it could get up to 20. It just depends on who you're using. So editing is very, 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 very costly. So be prepared for that. And think about that as you are reading through your book that second time, and remember we talked about those unnecessary words? Yeah, you want to take those out because if they're charging 5 to $10 a page that I'm using the higher end, you don't want to send them 200 pages and they end up cutting 100 or 50. You could have did that. So, you know, you're going to try to be, think of your words as money. Each word is money. So if you don't have to spend money on that word, take it out. Be very mindful of your words. Book covers can cost up to $150, on up to $400, maybe $500. Um, your ISBN could cost you $150. Now, here's the thing about the ISBN. Companies like um, the, the publishing companies that I told you about, are truly publishing companies. 
So they will offer you free ISBNs. What that means is when your book goes on Amazon, they are listed as the publisher of the book. They don't get any more money than they would have gotten just for printing the book. It's just you have to have a publisher. So if you know that the likelihood is that you're going to be writing many books, then you want to think about starting your own publishing company. It's not as hard as it seems. It's just a matter of going down to your secretary of state and getting your um, company name in the, on the books and, you know, getting your, your tax ID number and all of that. And um, that's, you know, you, everything that you would do would be through your company and, if you are like me and really truly making this a business, then you start thinking about how am I using this company to my advantage with your taxes, you know, with your paper, with your ink, with, you know, if you have to go somewhere doing a book signing, there's cost, that's a tax write off. So, you know, basically you make it work for you. That's why I keep saying that being a self-published author is truly a business because there are so many things that you have to think about and, pay for. So you want to budget your money wisely. You want to start saving because it's going to cost somewhere. You know, there are people that say, well, my aunt is an English teacher, so I'm gonna let her read it. And she may be able to read it for grammatical errors, for spelling errors. But if you are writing a fiction or nonfiction book at this point, and you really want it to flow well, and you want to, the gaps to be filled in, then you need someone who is skilled in that area just because someone is an english teacher does not mean they are skilled in the area of developing a story that only means they are skilled in teaching english so be careful because let me tell you if you short change on the editing it will show it will show and you do not want it to show marketing material things like um and you know of course marketing material isn't mandatory it isn't oh i wrote this book now i have to hurry up and go out and buy book marks and buy you know pens and you don't have to but i'm just i put it here because somewhere along the way you would want to because flyers are um postcards of with information about your book and your contact information is very, very helpful because if, like I said, when I went to the Zeta Boule, everybody did not walk away with the book, but the people that I could reach did walk away with my information. They may be a reader later on. So, you know, it's being able to put your information in as many hands as you can. Creating a buzz about your book. You want to get people talking about your book. You want people sharing information about your book. You want that because other people are going to buy it. Think about if you, if someone told you about this great meal that they had. You know, nine times out of 10, if you are into the meal that they're talking about, you're gonna, sorry. You're gonna wanna try it. You're gonna want to go and try it. You're gonna wanna buy it. If someone is talking about, you know, this great, you know, it depends on whatever it is you're into. So if they're readers and they're talking about a great book, you're going to go there. I do it all the time. People are on, Am not on Amazon, on Facebook. I'm in a lot of readers groups. People are sharing information about books and, oh, I just couldn't put this book down. I read this book in one sitting. And then with, uh, the more people that chime in about the great book, I'm gone to Amazon to buy that book. That's what a buzz does about for your book. It's just, you know, if, if people love it, you're going to want to try it too. It's just how we are. So here's how you create the buzz. Remember I talked about that author page, that Facebook page. Well, the closer you get to finishing your book, go ahead and start your author page. And, you know, your author page is where you're sharing information about your book. You're sharing, you know, details and doing different events in your author page. Like in my page, in my group, um, the Writing Warriors group, like I do the Wednesday workshop in your author's page, whatever your book is about, you may do something themed around that leading up to your book release. Um, build your email list. The email list is great because everybody, you know, we assume that people see things on Facebook, but everyone don't. You know, just because we put it out there does not mean that they see it, but if you email it to them, then it goes directly to them. So building your email list is very, very great. You may not really build your list until after you've 
um, publish your book and start doing more events. What I always have is a clipboard with just a simple form. People can write their name, email address, and I just ask them, would they mind joining my, my email list? So especially if they seem like they were interested in a book, but for whatever reason couldn't purchase it, well, I know that they're a reader. So I want to put them on my email list because I email you know, my upcoming books or new releases and all of that to my email list. And those are people that you know for sure want to read. You want to join groups and blogs that are related to your topic. In those groups and in those blogs, be active. Share information, answer questions, um, do so much that you almost put yourself out there as an expert because people will notice. If someone asks a question and you have the answer, answer it. You don't have to just read it and move on or like it and move on. Answer the question, share your knowledge. Because like I said, they're going to notice that and they're going to reach out to you personally at some point. They may become a reader. Um, find book bloggers. There are bloggers who only blog about books. What they will do is you will send them a copy of your book, ask for a review, and they will invite you on their blog. They are always looking for new material. Go out there and find them. Um, internet radio stations, again, always looking for new people. They will also request a copy of your book because they need to know the questions to ask. Send them a copy of your book, schedule your time to do your interview. They may have a huge following that will hear about your book, log on to Amazon and purchase. Beta readers, beta readers come before you even publish. Beta readers are your people who, after your book has been edited, well, yeah, it was after editing for me. So this is the process that I went through for my book. I went through it myself, sent it to my editor. She made suggestions, changes, what have you, sent it back. I went through it again, reviewed her stuff, made those changes, and then I sent it to, I think, five beta readers. These are just people who love to read. I sent the manuscript to them, people that you trust, because, and most likely, you know, at that point, because honestly, once you've typed your book, on your computer, once you've emailed it to your editor, it's already copyrighted, copyrighted to you. It's, it can be proven that you wrote that book. So even if you send a manuscript out, they can't do anything with it. And if they can, they risk, the, you know, they risk being sued. Because again, you can prove that you were the writer of that book, of that manuscript. So beta readers, though, are mainly people who just love reading. They are really not interested in putting a book out. So you're going to find these people I would not recommend close family, close friends, because they're going to say they love it. They're not going to know how to hurt your feelings if there's something in it they did not like. You want to use people who are going to give you their honest opinion. It may not feel good to get an honest opinion, especially if they don't like a certain part, but you rather hear it from these five people than put it out to the world and now everyone is talking about it. So take the critiques from these beta readers, use them to your advantage, make your book the best it can be before you publish it. So think about who you can use, you know, get um, people to recommend people to you, you know, that they may, oh, so-and-so love reading, you should send it to her, you know, there, it's not going to be hard to find beta readers. So those are ways that you're going to create a buzz. Oh, another thing about the beta readers is you ask them, to also, you know, if there was something about your book that they really love, you would ask them if they would post about it. You know, oh, I just, I was a beta reader for this upcoming book and it was so wonderful. I really love this, this, that, you know, and they're creating a buzz on their page to their people about your work. Okay. Plan for a successful book signing. How do you plan for a successful book signing? First of all, you have to announce it, announce it, announce it. Even if that means going old school, putting out flyers, sending it to um, these different groups, groups that may be interested in your work, you know, um, or what, anything that you could think of in the library. Ask them, can you put a flyer in the library? 
in these stores, a lot of times the, I know the hair stores, sometimes they have, um, what you call those things, cards and what have you. They may let you put your, if you have a flyer, not a flyer, postcard or something about your book signing. A lot of businesses sometimes will let will try to help you out. Announce it to as many people as you can. I know for me, I had to get over, oh, I feel like I'm just working on people's nerves. If I keep posting this on Facebook, people are going to get tired of me. Then let them get tired. The people that's going to get tired, you don't need them anyway. The people that are really there to support you will understand that you are promo promoting this for a purpose. And not only will they understand it, they're going to share it as well. So don't worry about the people that get tired of you posting. Post any way. Because like I said, a lot of times you post stuff and people may not see it that first time. They may not see it the second time. So you have to post throughout the day. You may post morning, noon, and night. Somebody's going to see it that missed it the first time. I found that, like the, um, I did a premiere a few weekends ago, a couple weekends ago. I still had people saying, I didn't even know about it. As much as I posted about that premiere, I did interviews with the premiere. Still had people that did not know. So don't just use social media. You have to get outside of social media. You have to actually talk to people, physical people, <laughs> letting them know. Um, have food. Food will draw a crowd, let me tell you. Have some food if you can. If you can get people to sponsor you, to donate food, um, you may want to think about um, cafes. I wouldn't use any major cafes, but, you know, local cafes or little mom and pop places that a lot of people may not know about. You may ask them if you can, if they could donate a dish and you will, you know, of course, advertise for them. That's free advertisement. So um, if you can have food, try to have food. Like I said, food will draw a crowd. Create your street team. These are your, this is your family, your friends, your people that's going hard for you. This is your street team. Your street team are the people that's going to go out, not physically out, but on their page and at work and at church. And, you know, if y'all don't go to the same church or what have you, but these are people that's promoting you, that's helping to hype, helping you to hype up your event. Um, they're sharing it on their page. They may even change their, I know I was a part of a group, a writing group, and we were the street team for each other. So when it was time for my, for our books to come out, we would all change our uh, profile picture to that book cover, to that person's book cover. And we would have the link on our page and we would post a review on our page. And, you know, if you have 10, 20 people on the same day changing their profile picture and if you have a hashtag for your book, that's going to cause, you know, people will notice. So if you have people promoting and saying about your book signing coming up, someone that didn't notice it on your page will notice it somewhere else. Join forces with other authors. This is so big because you have not only your group of supporters and readers, but you have their group of supporters and readers. And someone from their group may want to support you as well. That's more people. More people, more people, more people. That's the thing. Also, think about where you're doing your book signing. I... Um, when in the beginning, I was so excited. I was signing everywhere. I went to beauty salons. I went to nail, um, not nail shops. I went to, um, what is that? I went to a hair store. I mean, I, wherever. If someone said, oh, you can come set up a table here, I went. But it wasn't very successful because they weren't coming to read or to buy a book. They were coming with a purpose which was not purchasing a book. So it's important to make sure if you're doing an event that you are going to be around readers. Um, a lot of people do a lot of speaking engagements and you know a lot of these in, uh, events may have vendors tables available and I'm not saying don't go but just do your research and make sure it's worth your money because you don't want to constantly put out money and not get anything in return. So make sure you are going where readers will be there, okay? So, the do's and don'ts of a successful book signing. You want to engage your readers. 
by talking to them. When I was at the Zeta Boule, I barely sat down. The only time I sat down was when things got really, really slow and they were in uh, workshops. While it was moving, fast-paced people were in there, I was in front of my table. I was passing out flyers. I was beckoning people over. I was putting my book in people's hands. Whatever I could to get people to come to my table, I was doing. Engage your readers. Don't sit behind the table because that looks standoffish. It looks like you, you're creating a barrier between you and your readers. You want to be right there with them. People respect you for that. Have your elevator pitch ready to go. I don't know if you're familiar with the elevator pitch, but basically it's just your synopsis. What you say to tell people about your book. Now, I always um, invite people to read the back of the book synopsis, but you're always going to have those people that's going to say, I want you to tell me about it. And if they do, tell them. You have to know what you're saying. You have to be exciting. You have to be engaging. Don't, you know, a lot of authors, I'm so sorry, <laughs> a lot of authors are not, um, what you call that, Re they don't really like talking in public, you know, because we're people, we prefer, we shine behind the screen, we shine behind the keyboard, that's where we do our work, that's where we are our best, we feel, but there are going to be times where we're going to have to talk. And we're going to have to engage people. So go on and start working on that. You know, if you need to practice an elevator pitch, practice it. Practice selling your book because they want you to sell that book. And I'm telling you, when I'm talking about Dirty Little Secrets and I'm talking, and I'm like, baby, let me tell you, this woman and this man, these secrets in this book, like I'm just telling them so much that they're just like, okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to have to get it now. You done told me this. So but don't give the stuff away, of course. Don't give too much away, but draw them in enough to make them want to have to buy that book. Um, think about what you're going to write on the inside of the book. Uh, don't, because uh, that's another mistake I made in the beginning, trying to be creative and write all this fancy stuff to each of my readers. That's too much time. What I do now, I have like, for Dirty Dur Little Secrets, I think I just say, um, enjoy the secrets, L.A. Lewis. And I leave space at the top of that to write their name. So they're already pre-signed. All I have to do when they come up to me is fill their name in because they really don't want to have to stand there all day while you're writing another book in their book. So just try and think about your greeting and keep it short, simple, and sweet. These are some tools you will use to write. I found a lot of these, all of these actually. Well, there's only one I think that I did not use, but everything else I used um, when I was writing. So we have novels. Why did I put novels? And it's funny because I just had a conversation with the lady yesterday and she said exactly what I did when I wrote my first book. She said, I used to read a lot. But I stopped reading because I don't want to accidentally use someone's words in my work. So I don't want, I'm just not going to read. I'm just going to write. I made that very same mistake. And it was a mistake. Reading is so important if you're writing, especially the genre that you're writing. Read, read, read. Trust yourself enough to know that you are not going to steal anyone's work. It's not to say you will not read something that is going to inspire you or going to help you figure out where you had your block while you were writing. You may, and it's okay, but you will pick up a lot of books and you're going to read certain things in a lot of books that's going to feel the same because it's, you know, it's fine. It's fine. Don't write someone's words verbatim, you know you're not going to do that. So read, because you're reading for a different purpose. You're reading to learn. You're reading for the craft of writing. You're not reading for enjoyment anymore. So if you read with a different eye, you'll go into it with a different mindset. So read as much as you can. Next is journaling. Journaling is good. 
especially if you always feel like there's a block and you read you're writing but you just can't seem to keep going well then you can stop and start journaling journaling is free writing you're not worried about who's going to read it you're not worried about how it sounds it's just for you and that's going to help warm up your creativity so that you can you're able to go and start writing again so you know when i wrote again my first book i wrote it like i told you in three in a month i wrote it in a month it took a few months of course after that to actually get it published but the writing process itself was not long but my next book, it took longer, but that's because the expectation for myself has all, had already been built up. I had gotten good reviews from the first book and I put that fear in myself that what if they don't like this book? What if I can't repeat what I did in the first book? So it took me longer to write it because I kept doubting myself. And that's what a lot of us do while we're writing. We're wondering what will the reader think? Will they like this? How does this sound? In the beginning, just write it. Forget about all of that. So journaling is that place where you can just write and forget about expectations and all of that stuff. And it also, you're still writing. Even though it may not be something you're using, you're still writing. The Alpha Smart Word Processor, an actual tool. This I use um because I was on social media too much and I was on checking emails too much and doing everything else too much other than writing. So this little device, which is about $20, I think, helped me because I'm able to type my chapter. Um, it's not hooked up to any social media. It's not hooked up to anything. All I'm doing is typing. So I'm not distracted. And, um, but I'm distracted by these birds right now. <laughs> and what you do with the Alpha Smart Word Processor, and I'm distracted by these dogs, I'm sorry. What you do with the Alpha Smart Word Processor, you type it, and there's a cord that hooks from the word processor to your computer. So before you plug it up, you're gonna, you will turn your computer on, open up a word, a blank word document, Plug your Alpha Smart into your computer, and everything on your Alpha Smart transfers to your Word document. And you're able to type without being distracted. This is the dragon. The dragon, and there is a helicopter now. This is really fabulous. I know I would not be doing this anymore. My family will have to be locked in their rooms for now. Uh, a dragon is a device that you hook up to your computer. A lot of people, some people, are they shy away from writing because they can't type. And they write it, but you know, if you're gonna send it to an editor, it has to be typewritten. The dragon, you talk and the dragon type. So you have to program the dragon to recognize your voice, recognize your dialect, and um, then you just start typing, you just start talking and the dragon will start typing. Then there's Grammarly. This is a editing program that you can download to your Microsoft Word. You can also put it on Facebook, um, any of your social media. Grammarly edits your writing, it lets you know, and there's a free version and there's a paid for version. The free version checks for punctuation marks and misspelled words. The, the pay for version will also let you know if a sentence or if it's, um, what do you call that? A fragment or something like that. So it really goes in depth in your writing. So invest in mentoring. Why am I telling you that? Because it made all of the difference in the world with my writing. I wrote two books before I decided I needed a mentor. And that book that she mentored me through was the book, like I told you previously, that landed on the bestsellers list. So mentoring is so important, especially for new authors. There's so much about the craft of writing that you don't even know you don't know. You don't even know that you need to know. Like I didn't, I knew nothing about point of view until my mentor taught me point of view. 
So it's those things that, because my I use an editor, but my editor wasn't a teaching editor. All she did was change it, you know, or she she made the suggestion for me to change it. So I had to go back in and accept her changes. But she did not tell me or oh, think about your point of view and explain point of view and none of that. So a mentor, that's the person that sits down and walk you through all of that stuff, especially if you plan to write more than one book. Um, so that's pretty much the same thing. As you know, I am a mentor. I am a coach. My job is to help you get clear on your story, identify your ideal reader, outline your story, and plan for your book launch. So who my coaching program is for people who have a story idea and they're passionate about telling it. It is hard for me to help you if you have, like there are people who just want to write a book. They have no idea what they want to write about. They just, they just want to be an author. You would need to at least know something. Like you would at least come with at least an idea. Um, you need to be serious and committed about writing because my clients will tell you I'm serious and committed about helping you. And they may have thought they were going to come in and oh, I may do it. I may not know. They're going to finish and they're going to publish this book because they want it. And life will try to stop you. My job is to motivate you enough that you block out those outside voices and concentrate on this. And they need to be willing to sacrifice some time because it's going to take time. Um, a lot of people, there are people who will write the book for you. They're called ghost writers. You tell them your idea, they write your book. That's fine and dandy. I work with people who want to write it themselves. They want to feel that sense of accomplishment that they wrote their book. Those are the people that I work with. Um, I don't work with people who just see this as a hobby because they're not going to take it serious. I don't want to work with people who just want to write a book and, like I said, have no idea what they want to write about or they're not committed to writing. Um, and I, want, I don't want to write with people that's full of excuses because there's always going to be a reason why you can't do it. Always, always, always. My job is to help you find that reason why you can and push you to do it. So when I work with my clients, I give them a writing schedule. We outline their story. We work through their blocks. And more than anything, I'm their accountability, motivation, cheerleader, whatever they need me to be when they need me to be it. So if you decide that you do need a mentor and you are ready to get started and you really, really, really want this, I promise you that I will hold you to the same standards that my coach helped me to. The standards that helped me to finish my book, the standards that helped me to write a book, unlike any other book that I have ever written, learned more than I have ever learned, and got my book in enough hands to be a bestseller. That's my goal for all of my clients. So are you ready to write your book? That is actually the end. It's only 7.34. So I'm going to stop, share, and come back. Do you all have any questions? Because we do have more time left. Any questions about anything? I know it was a whole lot of material, which is why I gave you the workbook which is why I'm going to send you this recording because I want you to be able to go back and look and, you know, refer to it when needed. Um, I'm actually going to listen to it first. And if all of this going on around us is too much, I'm going to re-record it. So if I do not send you this version, I will send you a better version. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I had one question. Okay. Um, wait, I have like pages and pages and notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do will we get a copy of the PowerPoint? This yes. Well, it this video, the PowerPoint will be in the video, like you were seeing. It. Okay. Okay, that's good. I wanted to know the same thing. Okay. Yes. This it will be everything that you've seen. You will have in the PowerPoint. Like I said, if these birds are still chirping this loud and if it sounds this loud in this video, then I'm gonna record another version. Okay. 
I have actually, um, I have a date set up with you for act in October. So yes. we, if we have any questions, we just email you. With the oh yeah, definitely. Okay. All right, because that's what I, I have things I've jotted down as well. So yeah, I'm gonna email you some things and see. Okay. You know where and to find am, me. You know, and I'm definitely looking into needing. I know a mentor or a coach. I know <laughs> I need that. So yes. Yes, yes, yes. Because how you had this idea far too long, right? Yes, far too long, far too long. And I, I have, I have done more with it. I think the ending of the summer than I've had before. So yeah. So I'm in my room and I'm like, oh my god! I took my body off my head. I was like, oh my god! Look at this! I put that paper right back up. I was like. Mm -mm. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, my head looks a mess. No, it yes. does not. <laughs> no, it sure doesn't. It does not. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> then my child, my, my daughter kept trying to come in. I was like, get out. <laughs> <laughs> so did you learn anything new? Yes. I, I did. did. I did. Good. Yes. Uh, about the alpha smart word processor. Mm -hmm. Where do you get that? Where do you buy it? Um, Amazon. Okay. Okay. So you can't go inside like um, Walmart or? I haven't seen them at Walmart. Probably not because it's really old. The word processor, okay. they don't really sell those anymore. So I would try either Amazon or eBay. Okay. Okay. Amazon or eBay. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, and I, I'm gonna. I tried to chat with you, and I don't know if you got it or not, Lorna. Let me see. Because I wasn't. I was trying to figure it out as you were talking. Uh -huh. But I'm gonna have to go get my daughter, so I'm gonna have to leave the group. But okay. I tried to chat. And I don't know what I was doing. I no, I don't see a chat. I don't see a message. Okay. I don't know what I did. Who knows what I was doing? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But it, this was very informative. I, I was um, actually wondering, you know, about, like you said, have a different people kind of read a little bit of what you're doing, but to make sure that they're being honest with you and not because they, you know, they like you and they don't want to, exactly. you know, hurt your feelings. Right. So, um, yeah, that was, you know, that was something that I was kind of been dealing with a little bit. Just want to make sure that folks was who I chose to read would be people that, you know, yeah, would be really honest. Yeah. Now, let me say this, though. In the beginning, I did you, like, my um, my cousins, my cousin and my best friend were the people I was sending, like, I would write a chapter and I would email it to them. Yeah. And yeah. they were, you know, they loved everything. But I needed that to finish because they motivated okay. me. You know, they were like, girl, this is good. When are you going to send the rest of it? So <laughs> in the beginning, I will use those people. But when it comes to the editing part of it and really making sure that it all makes sense, then I use outside people to, you know, help me really shape this story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, in the beginning, use those people that's pushing you and encouraging you to go on and finish because you don't really need to hear the negative right now. You just need to get it out. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. And you're right. Well, okay then. But thank you, Lorna. And I will be getting back in touch with you. Good. Thank you. I'm so happy you joined. All right. See All you later. Right. Have a good one. Okay, so how do I get out of this? Uh, I mean, well, we're finished now, so. Yep, if you have no more questions, we are done. When you send it, when we send it, um, when you send everything to the email, it'll just come. It'll come like, as a, like a, a video. Like the, uh, like the other one did. Yeah, it would come as a video. So you would just be able to download it to your computer and or save it to your computer oh, okay and then well i did have a question about the um like you didn't mention website like when you're trying to get into like you know create your own website and all of that oh yeah the um now the website is going to be important because once you start doing your radio interviews once you start doing you know any interview the first thing they're going to say is do you have a website? Mm -hmm. okay, you're going to need to be able to say, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. 
So I created my own on Wix. I've used Wix and I use Webs, and both of those are in your workbook. And you could just click on the link to Wix or Webs. They are very, very easy. They are user friendly for people like me who have no idea about setting up a website. So mm-hmm. it really walks you through it. You choose your template. You know, it's it's very easy to set up. And you're able to sell your books through your website. So you can set up a store through your website. You said a store too? Uh-huh. Where if you wanted to sell your books on your website, mm-hmm. you will be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, yes, ma'am. That's what I was... Um. I was thinking, but okay, perfect. I really enjoyed it. I'm so happy that I didn't let the distractions get to me. I (laughs) sat down and good to go. So I just can't wait so I can go back to the, um, you know, go back to the the notes, my notes that I jotted down. And if it was some things that I need to review, then I can go back and into the uh, the PowerPoint. Yeah. And then the, the web, I mean, the, the workbook, we just can print that. How many pages is it? I believe it's like 18. Oh, okay. Yep. And the, um, there are some links in there as well. So you may, you know, with, with the links, you just click on them and it takes you to the website, the different websites that I talked about. Okay. All right. Well, we I will definitely have my appointment um, in October. Yes. Um, and so I think that's October 15th or something we said. Yeah, I wrote it on my calendar. I think so. Yeah, I don't know when I, uh, oh yeah, uh, October 15th. So <laughs> eight week coaching program. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we'll be definitely in touch. And then so I just pay you on um, with my first payment on October 15th. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. I'm so glad it was helpful. I was like, I hope it's not too much. (laughs) Oh, no, it was perfect because it was like I was taking an online course or something. (laughs) (laughs) But it was wonderful. It was good. Good. I'm excited now. I'm glad. That's what I was hoping for. Yes, ma'am. Well, we'll be in touch. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great evening. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.